Bristol, thank you very much for joining us today. You became chairman in uh, May 2012, and one could call that the low point in, in the very long history of Nokia. Very difficult time. Could you describe why, why you decided to accept that uh, challenging position, and, and what was Nokia like at that point in time? Uh, we were planning the biggest layoffs in the company's 150-year history. Our revenues declined by 26% in the quarter when I was appointed chairman. Our net losses or operating losses were over 2 billion during the first six months of that year. And I could continue that long list of, of sort of dark tidings. But we understood the challenge and again at that time I decided to do things differently. How did you change the leadership and board practices of, of Nokia in this very difficult time? I said laid out golden rules for our board work. Of course, discussed those with the board members and we approved them together after making some changes to my original proposal. But I'll, I'll mention three rules out of seven. The first one was assume the best of intentions from others, i.e. we want to be honest about bad news. One of my favorite sayings is that bad news is good news, good news is no news, and no news is bad news. The second thing was that we'll be a data-driven board and we'll work, work harder than normal boards or average boards do. And the third rule out of the seven that I want to mention is, is one where we determined that any meeting where we don't laugh out loud is a complete failure. So we need to have fun, especially when we deal with the, the most difficult and most emotional decisions, like for us, the selling of the handset business to Microsoft. Why did you decide to center the current Nokia on the networks business instead of the devices business, which used to be the focal point? Deciding to focus on networking was not a decision to focus on the sort of the old definition of networking, but a decision to focus on what we call the programmable world, where we program the environment we live in. And much of that programming will be done through AI, sort of configuring the environment where we live in in real time based on the data and the analysis that is gathered through the billions of sensors that will be surrounding us. Now, since uh, May 2012, when you started as the chairman, Nokia's enterprise value has grown by approximately 20 times. And there were many external moves during that period. What were the internal moves that haven't really been visible outside that made this transformation work? If you Take the point of view of looking at our employee base currently. We have 106,000 employees, but over 99% of them did not carry a Nokia badge just three years ago. So it's not about internal moves. It has been a, a complete removal of engines, the cabin and the wings in mid-flight of an airplane and reassembling the airplane to look very different while in mid-flight. How have you been able to to preserve Nokia as, as Nokia, even though everybody has essentially changed their jobs. It's almost as if the company really has a soul, and the soul is there regardless of what I do. And I have really felt that the soul survived this operation. What advice would you have for other leaders who are undergoing a major transformation, such as the one you went through? Well, I'd say number one thing is that don't believe all the advice that you get. Think for yourself, what makes sense? Number two probably would be, be a paranoid optimist. It's a good way to navigate through hard times. Number three would be gather great people around you and change people in the team very quickly if you need to. Risto, thank you very much for speaking with us today. Thank you.